I'm Alex Martelli, you may know me. I'm best known as the author of uh, Python in a... Okay, um, apologies in advance if the presentation is not up to my usual standards, but I'm not used to being chained in one spot. I'm a walker, but there is no moving mic. Um, as I said, probably best known for Python in a nutshell, the third edition is just out, co-authored with uh, my wife, Anna Martelli Ravenscroft, and Steve Holden used to be the organizers of the very first PyCon. But this is outside what I cover in Python in a nutshell. Actually, I would say the Python here is only used for examples. And what I'm trying to show is just about as useful in any programming language you may be using. Because in any programming language, a typical software system can be seen as a directed acyclic graph in which there's a lower layer of modules or services or components, call them as you will, that uh, provide some functionality but don't depend on any other that you've written. They may be uh, interfacing external entities, of course, like a database and a domain name system in this uh, example. There's middle layers which both depend on some modules and are depended upon, and there's top layers that are not depended on, but depend on any other subsystem. So, as long as you don't have any cycle in your directed graph, any directed acyclic graph can have its node classified in these. If you do have cycles, you have far bigger problems than I can hope to address. Because the point is, uh, they arrows are dependencies. If you have a cycle, it means A depends on B and B depends on A and you're in hell. And thus completely refactor everything, break the dependency cycle. That's much more important than anything else I or anybody else can teach you. So leave the conference and go do that and break your dependency cycles. It's really, really you want to do that. If you don't have dependency cycles, this will always hold. I've had some questions about, wait, multiple top layers? Well, duh, it's, it is 2017, I'm told. So of course you will have an API and a web uh, interface and perhaps a local uh, graphical user interface and a local command line interface. So you will have multiple top level. I certainly hope so if your system is rich and complicated enough. So, the next issue is, okay, so we have that thing. Why do we test it? Okay, unfortunately in 45 minutes I cannot, uh, I cannot compress a few hours worth of explanation of why testing is the crucial discipline in software development and I would recommend you go online, find any other talk I've ever given and most other talks given by other people and get those to understand why you really want, why you really have to test. We want to be covering them today. The, what I'm covering here is the how. Not, not the why, but the how. The most antique, traditional form of testing, distinguished test into white box, meaning tests that are written in full knowledge of what's inside, the components being tested, and black box, which is supposed to only use the uh, external uh, co uh, connections uh, made available by the components. Uh, that has been dropped since a long time in professional practice. It's not a very useful distinction. Uh, however, what, how we do things in the modern way looks like the old way with uh, new names and it's not much more useful. Uh, we nowadays tend to have unit tests which are really white boxy, typically looking a lot inside the components they're testing and they're written by developers for developers uh, just to uh, ease development. Nothing wrong with that but that's like one extreme and then we only have the other extreme. Integration tests which are end-to-end 
So they do have to go from uh, soup to nuts, uh, I think is the British expression for a complete meal. Um, and it will often have stuff that cannot really be automated and therefore need a human being in the loop. If you need a human being in the loop, by my lights, you don't really have a test. You have a separate step of your software development and delivery cycle, which I like to call quality assurance. Use a different term than testing, because for my point of view, testing has to be automated. So for a complete end-to-end -end thing, you can automate tests when the top unit is an API, a common line interface, a web page using Selenium and similar tools. If it's a graphical unique interface running locally, there are some tricks to do that, but you'll never do it right. And meanwhile, what about all the other things we'd like to automate and we'd like to use in a continuous integration environment so that something gets fully integrated and released and deployed only when all tests pass. If there have to be human in the testing loop, you just can't do that. Humans are unreliable, non, not repeatable, very bad at mechanically repeating a series of operations, very slow, very costly. There's a million reasons you must not have humans in the loop of testing. I have a completely different proposal. We have a software system composed of components, modules, services, microservices nowadays, whatever, doesn't matter. All the dependencies are all we're looking at, which naturally forms layers. Why not structure our tests in the same way we inevitably naturally structure our software, assuming we make it modular at all as opposed to one big million line uh, program, which I hope none of us would do. In this view, then of course we have unit tests. They have to be very fast because they're running all the time. They focus strictly on a components or module or service internal logic so that at the limit you can mock out every dependency. I think they need to be fast, essentially, above all. It's the top priority for your unit test is make them fast. Then, building upon that, and we'll see how, we'll have higher layer tests, but not on a single big jump from unit test all the way to end-to-end -to -end takes forever test. We'll do layers and layers of testing, as we'll see. It, you can see this as a pattern language of testing structures. Uh, pattern languages are most uh, understood in this community for design purposes, but they also apply to a lot of other human creati creative activity, and one of them is testing. In a sense, we're talking about how to design, but also how to execute the test. Sometimes I have, I get uh, interesting objections at this point about what do you mean fast above all? I, I, I think of fast when I'm doing production stuff, tests. I don't need to be fast, right? Yes, you do. In a modern develop, integrated development arrangement, your tests, your unit tests, should be running all the time in the background. As the system sees you've saved uh, some changes to a file, it should reload that and every dependency that and every test that can be affected and rerun them all for you. In this, if, if that's the setup you have, and I hope so because it really multiplies your productivity, uh, and just about any IDE is able to do that today, if you have that, and your test, uh, set of tests that has been modified it takes 10 seconds to run, then if there's any problem, you're alerted within 10 seconds of saving the problematic code. So you're, it's still top of your mind. You can see the error and probably say exactly, oh, duh, see immediately what you did wrong, fix it, and proceed. If it's five minutes, you've lost mental context. You've moved on to another task. You now need quite a bit of time to get back in your mind to what was I thinking when I wrote that, and th now you're losing all of that you've done after, 
seriously, an order of magnitude impact on your productivity because you didn't think that your test should be, first of all, fast, fast, fast. Oh, but integration tests certainly can afford to be slow. Well, I have a very recent case study showing why not. Python 361 release candidate one. So what was it, three months ago, something like that? Um, the, uh, okay, in the, uh, in the uh, speaker notes, uh, I have the URL to the discussion on Python committers about what was going on. Essentially, Brett Cannon had to announce he had turned off the gating of uh, uh, integration tests on the continuous integration of uh, uh, 361, release candidate one, because they were taking forever. So actually, integrating a pull request was getting so slow that the uh, uh, release in question would have probably come out around 2023 or something like that. If your integration tests aren't fast enough, you might as well not have them. That's how important fast is for your integration test. Okay, there's a difference here. Because if you are well-funded, rich, uh, have general sponsors, uh, you can be running your integration tests on a million machines. Well, a million would be a bit of an overkill, but on a lot of machines. So as long as the slowest one is fast enough, the others are running in parallel, and everything is rosy. Most open source projects don't have unlimited amounts of machines at hand. So we get uh, charity by Travis or whoever, and we can use, I don't know the exact number, Larry may know since he's been uh, such a sponsor, such a uh, release engineer, release uh, captain for so many releases of Python, but I think it's a single digit uh, number of uh, of servers not anywhere like enough. So you need to be fast, fast, fast. Now, everything that applies to uh, other forms of automated testing still does. I wish I had a couple more hours to recap everything. I'd probably bore half of you, but... So the first thing is all tests must be reproducible. That seems obvious, but people keep running into problems. One of them is, oh, but I have a human there. <laughs> and get it out, or it's not an automated test. But one example, but, but my module uses random numbers. Well then, make sure that you're able to inject a fixed seed so that your test will actually be doing the same sequence of random numbers. There's some delicacy there because maybe on, on some cases you're, you're calling the generator five times and on other paths seven times, so the same seed may not actually give. But you, if you're using random numbers, presumably you know all of that and can and should keep it under control. Much more common. Oh, but my code does something different depending on what day of the week it is or what time of day it is because it needs to do something, if it's between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, something different out of hours. Well, great, but then you have to uh, somehow fake out the time and make sure to test both, in this case, two behaviors that uh, your program should have in office hours and out, out of hours. Because otherwise, if you're just letting the time be whatever time you happen to run the test on, that's essentially random because you may be running them any time, all the time. And many other excellent mandatory quality of tests, whether layered or not, the fundamental things apply. Now, let's start with some bit more concrete to show what I'm talking about. How do we test this uh, database adapter? Well, the first, so maybe I'm just testing my own logic, then all I need to do is a mock of the external DB component. Incidentally, there's a beginner's talk about mocks this afternoon, which unless you're completely familiar with them, mocking and patching uh, is highly recommended. It's kind of a, prerequisite of this talk, but 
even get, getting it after is better than not getting it at all. So mocking is fine as long as you are certain you understand 100% of the behavior characteristics of that external DB. But there's a second possibility, which when feasible can often be better. Use a fake, also known as an emulated form of DB. That's local, that's control local, so don't, you don't have to pay for network traffic, uh, pay or slow down things. Uh, it's totally under your control. We'll point out some details. <coughs> Maybe it's in memory because you don't need gigabytes and gigabytes for a test, so you can make a smaller version. But the crucial thing, it must uh, respect all the same semantic constraints as the real system you'll be running in production. What's a semantic constraint? Uh, one example that's unfortunately common among various databases, after close, the close method had been called on a connection, any other, no other method must be called on that connection. If any other method is called, then a runtime error will be raised. If this is the way the real DB behaves, then it's absolutely crucial that the fake emulates this behavior. So it keeps track of whether the connection's been closed, and if it's been closed and some other method gets called, then boom, it raises that exception. Uh, a mock, of course, will not do that, not naturally, unless you know you have to specifically watch for it. If you do specifically know, make sure your mock does have that because other future maintainers of the code may miss that subtle semantic constraint and if your mock has this completeness, it will help. But this is an example of a general problem of mocking. Mock, you, stuff that you write to help your uh, testing reflect the same understanding of the external system that your code reflects. If you understood that close must be the last method called the connection, then you won't call any more in your code and your mock will check and give an error if you do. But if you don't understand that, the test will pass anyway because the mock will not do the check. So um, the problem, it's a, there's a common mode of potential failure between the test not catching something and your code having that defect. Um, the uh, only real solution to that is the fake, which we'll get to again. And again, there's another talk specifically about verified fakes, which I strongly recommend. Okay, um, incidentally, uh, fake, in addition to having to respect all the semantic constraints of the thing it's faking, may add others. The most typical example for something like a database, the fake could say no more than 32 megabyte of data just because it's in memory and that will make it, should be enough for testing. Now, given this set of constraints, set of approaches, uh, this is where I use uh, Python for examples, and I assume that the mock module has been taken from the unit test package. I'm not going to repeat this line. It applies to all my successive examples. I'm using mock first because mock patch is uh, such a great way to temporarily substitute something for a real component and then take it out away automatically. I, I do that. Mock offers, unit test mock offers many ways to do it. I, I always use, uh, in these examples, uh, the with statement because it's such a natural way to say, do this temporarily, okay, I'll end of the with block, undo it, whatever. Um, so I'm mocking. I'm using auto spec. In the mock talk, I believe, uh, prefers the spec set and other things. These, these are specific to unit test mock and well worth pondering, and that's why I strongly recommend this afternoon's talk. Uh, but essentially, it makes, it puts in place uh, uh, something that will emulate most anything, and for the details of the behavior, you set its uh, side effect uh, 
field. In particular, here I'm, I'm setting the side effect of the cursor of the connection of the fake database. So FTB, connect cursor, side effect. And then, the body of tests. What's that? We'll see. But it is a big chunk of code, presumably split into functions, methods, whatever, which exercise every meaningful path of the application code. Well, the, of the code I own, the code I write. Now, if what I'm doing is a second layer, so using a fake instead of a mock, then the typical structure is make the fake with appropriate parameters, patch it into, say, new equal in, in, in mock patch instead of, uh, of auto spectru, which sets an existing object in lieu of the other, and then populate, in this case, the database by actually executing, uh, for example, SQL statements on, on a cursor of this connection, and then the same body of tests as before because we've set up exactly the same situation except with a fake instead of a mock, and we can proceed. And for full integration test, well, I presumably, I start an instance of the database. Presumably locally, like for example, uh, on, on the machine I'm using for tests, so I can connect, so the connection can use a, a Unix socket, which is faster than a network socket that I'd have to use um, if it was actually on the net, and, and populate it somehow, maybe just by executing stuff or importing a, a dump or something, so it's got an initial situation, and then the same body of tests that I was using in unit tests, which is where the novelty applies. The body of test is a core reusable part of the test for a certain component. It exercises all meaningful paths, and that must include simulated errors. Incidentally, if you're using mocks or other forms of spies, we'll briefly uh, summarize all the various test doubles later, but uh, you can also check what calls there have been, what arguments, be careful of not falling into the trap of uh, white box ITs. You don't want your tests to have exactly the same structure of the code so that if uh, some innocuous change to the code causes the test to fail, that's not the purpose. The, the test give you confidence that the code is, is still working, so they must not reflect. So if it's indifferent whether A happens first and then B or vice versa, make sure it's indifferent in your test. The extra checks are optional. Mocks are also always spies, so they make it free, but you can always wrap anything with a spy to just allow those checks if you're really keen about them. So the big point in any case is there's a difference between mocks and fakes, and there are many other kind of test doubles. Unfortunately, the classic article in the matter, Martin Fowler's, uh, per this URL, um, is very Java-oriented. Still, as I mentioned at the start, uh, these concepts apply to just about any programming language you might want to use, except, of course, that to give examples in Java, considering every every variable must be at least 45 characters long and with several capitals in the middle will take more pixels, but whatever. They from my point of view, rather than the important fine-grained detail between a dummy and a fake and a mock and a stub and a spy and so on, is who owns it, who maintains it, who releases it. A fake, the way I'm using the term, is something that is maintained and released by the same group which, who maintains and releases the software being faked. So if I I'm part of a open source group maintaining and releasing a database, I will have a fake version of the database ready for testing. Uh, an example a bit incomplete, uh, SQLite, which comes with uh, the standard library, uh, is a perfectly usable database for reasonably small uh, store, like a few, 
few gig gigabyte of stuff, but it also has a uh, colon memory colon special uh, word to use instead of the file name. It will make the database in memory, which can be useful for very small databases, but more, more particularly for tests. It's not complete, as we'll see. It's not the all you'd want a, a fake. So again, there's a talk later on validated fakes later this morning, which I strongly recommend because it will go deeper into what I can barely mention. So a mock is very flexible, can simulate anything, but because, exactly because of that, it can simulate something you think should exist but is not what actually exists. The fake as a fast limited emulation of the exact set of things that do exist, um, they both should, and this is where SQLite falls short as a uh, fake of itself, be able to simulate any error. That is, uh, b they should be able to be set so that uh, instead of giving a result, they will raise an exception, a specified exception. Uh, that's trivial with mock. It, you just assign the exception to the side effect uh, instead of the, of the result, but uh, for the fake, the fake must have been uh, presented this way. Or you can kind of hack it by wrapping a mock around the fake for the sole purpose, but it gets kind of grotty. Anyway, um, the reason is that certain errors in particular, which are crucial to be handled correctly, are almost impossible to simulate, to, to verify that, that your code makes any sense, except if your mock or fake or whatever is able to simulate it. So, for example, what do you do if uh, the CPU catches fire? Well, you presumably catch the CPU on fire exception and, and proceed to, to turn down, but the point is how do you test that because it takes a lot of CPUs to be burned and, and it's hard to automate too if, if you really need to do that. The, by far the best is a, is a mock or something that raises the CPU on fire and then you check that. You handled it gratefully. Now, moving to a middle layer module, what changes? Well. For the pure unit test, you can mock out the low-level modules, LL1 and LL2, on which it depends. In this case, you have fewer risks. Presumably, uh, all the uh, modules and components we're drawing are owned by the same team, so there is good understanding around. Uh, so you don't really risk, hopefully you don't, you just need to get your mocks reviewed by the specialists who know LL1, who know LL2. There is, however, an interesting alternative for a mid-layer. What if I use the actual LL1 and LL2? In this case, there are no further dependencies, so no further problem. Well, it works if they're fast enough. Don't you, aren't you sure if they are? That's what time it is for, measuring the speed of a specific fragment of code. Uh, if they are fast enough, you don't need to do the mocking. That uh, makes uh, less work for you. If you need to verify at the start, you need the same amount of work. But then, if the uh, actual modules are fast enough, ta -da, you don't have to maintain them going forward. Remember, there are some uh, priming that you need to be able to do in your low levels, uh, which include simulating errors as well as whatever else is needed for speed, like equivalent to the colon memory thing in SQLite. Uh, and this is the schema. As again, there's a prepare uh, of, with side effects uh, and then the body, or the uh, prepare with priming and then the body. What about, what about a high level, like picking one? Well, then you have several uh, potential chains of dependencies, and you can do a pure uh, unit test by mo mocking out the mid layers. You can do a second layer by using the actual mid layers and mocking down below. Uh, sometimes you can use the real one. Uh, there's many possibilities of mixing. You have to pick a subset because if you try to do every possible combination, you suffer a combinatorial explosion and don't get extra useful coverage for 
your effort. I, so I'm taking, I'm picking one uh, set of mocking uh, versus actualing and faking, and this is the code for that single case. So this, this time you see body of tests only once, but that's because uh, this is only one uh, of the many layers I recommend. So what do you use? Well, the decision depends a lot on the characteristic of your code. Again, mock, it's probably fastest and least accurate. Actual is least work if uh, fast enough, if it's designed to be primable for speed and other things like uh, faking errors. Fake is probably best if uh, you're using software which releases it incidentally. It need not be open source, for example, uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, services are, be are all being released uh, with uh, emulators on the side so that you can run your tests locally without necessarily. I know because I lead tech support for Google Cloud Platform and I really annoy my uh, engineering and program manager colleague by saying uh, every time there's a bug in a customer which could have been avoided if they had run tests, I go to my colleague and say, see, he couldn't run tests because you didn't release an emulator for this service and that service. When can I see it? Because <laughs> otherwise I can send you the problems <laughs> and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, and one of the choices is uh, to control the complexity. Sometimes it's not obvious. When you say DNS, domain name system, for most people it means, okay, I get uh, foo.com and translate that into an IP 1234. That's uh, known as the A record in DNS. But DNS has a million other kind of records from the C name to the TXT. And maybe uh, you need the TXT record to validate ownership of a domain and so on, in which case, it's not a trivial mock anymore, as would be if you only needed A or quad A records. Before I finish, I have a, I've been asked a very interesting question, but does it apply to load testing? Well, there's a whole thing about uh, measuring performance, so it takes the whole afternoon today, so you may want to go that in if you really need load tests for performance. But Unfortunately, it doesn't apply, the, the layering concept doesn't apply fully because you can't really measure based on the layer except end-to-end. -end. So there, the end-to-end -end is needed. You can take correctness for granted. It needs to be tested by separate test and low test, but speed, if you need to measure precisely, you need the end-to-end. -end. Um, and with different body of tests, too, you don't want the... Uh, retest correctness. Correctness must be tested separately. You want to exercise the, uh, the slow parts, the heavy computational or, or I.O. parts. Uh, you can give boundary. If, uh, if your lower lab level models, models you depend on, have a service level agreement, the kind of 90% of queries complete in less than 30 milliseconds, that kind of thing, and you need to guarantee something similar to your uh, users, uh, there is an approach which gives you a worst case estimate. Essentially, you can use the intermediate test to measure the actual time spent in your code and count the number of calls to the external services. Incidentally, if the external services don't give you a service level agreement, then you cannot offer any uh, in turn because any single call to one of those could stop forever. And this is about the body of tests for that. Uh, on the other hand, other question is, but can I use uh, this approach when what I want to test is a refactoring? Of course you can, indeed, if the refactoring, uh, by incidentally, because refactoring means changing the internals of the code without theoretically changing any uh, of the externally observable behavior. Uh, if uh, it's all within a module, this is the base case. All the talk applies entirely to testing that module. Uh -huh. the, you may need to tweak uh, test bodies, uh, the body of tests, just for, to maintain coverage, because maybe some things have gone away and you don't need to test them anymore or something. Um, for moving functionality between modules, uh, the first thing you do is you change the code and check that the unit tests of those modules, at least 
the one from which you've taken things away, fail. This is the typical approach of test first, but it's automatic because you already <coughs> have the test before you do the refactoring. Remember, never refactor code without test is what Michael Feathers called legacy code. Always put some tests in place first if you're so unfortunate to have to deal with legacy code. So you make the test fail, you run the test, they automatically fail, now you edit the test bodies and potentially module mocks and fakes, and now they pass, check, and then the intermediate levels showing that higher level mod, the intermediate uh, tests in the version using the actual lower levels showing the higher level uh, modules are not affected and everything is happy. Uh, finally, uh, one problem with unit tests uh, having to be passed is that uh, sometimes, not, fa not often, uh, just checking that a condition was actually satisfied can be too time consuming to fit in the very short time I want my unit test to run in. When that happens, what I've done sometimes is dump, like uh, snapshot the state of the whole system at the end, check only what's fast to check, and leave a nice uh, uh, blob from which the whole uh, st system status can be reconstructed, as if I was doing snapshot and restart. And then, in the background, asynchronously, just run background jobs, which continuously check for sanity, whatever is very slow and long to check. This has worked so well for me that I've started doing snapshot when performance affords, even in, te in production runs, as opposed to test run. A production run goes, nobody complains, everything seems to have gone well, but I have a snapshot there, and with some probability, some random sample, I sanity check afterwards. Once in a while, this will let you catch a problem that was just barely hidden, didn't uh, hurt your users, but you're caught it before it's caught your users, which is by far the best thing. And this lets us on to question and answer. The, uh, uh, everything including the speaker's note, which I've been talking about, is in that PDF on my website. Yes. Do we have a mic for the questions? Thanks. Uh, one small question. What do you think about possibility of using like real database, a simulated database? Uh, is that not, okay, that's better? Okay. Yeah, what do you think about possibility to use real database, a simulated database, but real data is in, is in memory. So when you run unit, unit test, you don't start anything, you just create new database in memory, put few records there, and after read them. It will be fast, but at the same time, it will give you kind of, you can be sure that everything works as will be work on real database, because... I'm sorry, but I can't imagine of a situation where uh, there's an error I can't, I can't check. I mean, if, is it, is there a material difference between what I've written and what I should have written? If, if no, then there is no error. If yes, then of course I can detect it. So you'd need uh, maybe afterwards, uh, we can sit down at, uh, with a piece of paper and you can show me an example because I just cannot conceive of one. It seems logically impossible. If the checks are proper. If the checks take too long, see the last slide. You do them offline. Okay. So if your software is fast enough, and let's say small enough, whatever that means, but it still has layers, would you say that skipping mocking and faking is a good idea and just doing integration tests if they run fast? Because it kind of cuts down on workload of writing mocks and fakes. So if uh, your code is, sorry, I need to stay nailed here. Um, If your code does pure, uh, totally CPU-bound computational issues, then 
the speed is constrained by your CPU. Uh, such code is normally best move to NumPy or similar libraries which you assume are correct because you know Eric Raymond's uh, most famous quote, given enough eyeballs, uh, all bugs are shallow. With a million users of NumPy, bugs don't have a very long life there. Um, and this has a little advantage that uh, by taking it for granted that NumPy is correct, you can mock it out <laughs> without anomalies and your whole test will be correct. If, as most programs, your is I.O. bound, uh, then is where mocking and faking and so on makes a big difference. Because a lot of that I.O. may go, I don't know, to a magnetic disk. Well, if it stays in memory instead, that'll be faster. It may go over the network. If it stays local, that will be faster, and so on and so forth. The, Little bit by little bit, uh, you can easily gain order of magnitude by sufficient simulation and... Thank you. How much longer do we have? So, one, two more questions. So it's lovely to hear that your teams produce good fakes. How common would you say this is? Because my experience I'm with sorry, fake... I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, my experience with faking things is that the fakes do not exist elsewhere, and you burn a lot of time failing to fully understand the system. Would you say that it is becoming more common? You mentioned that your teams, you push them hard to produce fakes. I want to ask about integration tests. What do you think? In what detail would you include online uh, distributed services in your integration tests? It doesn't seem, seem feasible with CI, but then you need to use mocks or some, or some fakes for your online services. So I'm sorry. The oh, acoustic is a little hard. If I understood correctly, you're talking about uh, real-time software, software with some kind of real-time constraints? Uh, let's assume your DB is in, on another server somewhere. It's, it requires internet connection, a socket, something to run end-to-end -end integration tests on CI. Although I'm still not sure, I've been pointed at the question, I believe that generally uh, the more real-life constraints the real software has, the more the test will be living in a simulated universe, a fantasy universe, where things can go well or badly in a simulated and controlled way. I normally see, get asked this about uh, IoT, Internet of Things applications, where indeed uh, the big deal is how do I deal with a million teeny gadget all over the place? Well, you don't. Well, you do in your code, I hope, but not in your test. That uh, even the so-called end-to-end test, are you going to like have a million uh, rumbos uh, going around a huge room? Probably not. There will be some level of, of simulation, inevitably otherwise. 
the test will be so costly. It's like, uh, how do you test if, so my software uh, controls a rocket putting men on Mars. How do I test that? Well, not end to end, <laughs> because if the, the, then you have to get them back from Mars. It's a real problem. Okay, thank you very much.